Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world today. My name is Steve Hall. I'm Director of Content and Community with Procurement Leaders. Uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to bring you today's webinar. We're going to be looking at easy changes you can make to your S2P process from an instant impact. Um, I think what's particularly exciting is this idea of look, looking at practical changes, taking something very big like S2P and thinking what can you do to move the dial to take the next step. Um, we're very pleased to be partnering with Determined to bring you today's webinar. We know it's a topic they're very excited about. Uh, we've asked uh, uh, Gerard Dehan to join our panel um, and to provide his expertise. We're also providing a mix of a really exciting uh, story from an organization that's taken some, some real steps with S2P, and we're providing a procurement leader's point of view so you can hear a little bit around our, the view of our network as well and how they're progressing. So what are we going to be talking about? I mentioned STP. Well, we've just uh, recently completed the Procurement Leaders Data Intelligence and Tech Forum, and a couple of things really came from the f to the fore in the conversations we were having around data and tech, um, particularly that you need to focus on business outcomes. And I, I, I'm sure this is something that we, maybe we say a lot, but we shouldn't definitely take for granted. What business problems are we trying to solve here? And particularly, what are we doing for our customers? So what is procurement doing to make sure it is driving adoption, it's keeping the user in sight throughout its journey, it's optimizing, but not optimizing just to make it easy for procurement, but also to make it easy, again, for its internal stakeholders. And particularly looking at things like ROI, how can you really take uh, the data that's available, how can you become a champion for your for your stakeholders, providing them with intelligence, making them look clever by giving them simple decisions to make. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, and part of that comes through understanding the technology, part of it comes through understanding the processes and the strategies available, and part of it comes through understanding the capabilities you need in your organization in order to take steps. One of the ways that we're going to do this is to really think about how we can move the needle, how can we transform, and how can we learn from other organizations. And I'm really excited that we're going to be queuing up in a moment the, the case study from, uh, uh, from the organization we've got joining us today, um, who've got a really interesting story to tell, uh, and that's Watermark Retirement Communities. Um, we're very grateful for them for joining the call today, so we're going to be hearing from them in just a moment. Um, before I introduce our panel, um, I'd like to just quickly talk through uh, some of the tools available. You can obviously, at any point during today's webinar, you should be able to um, provide feedback on, on what, we've, uh, what we've been providing there. You can see that on the screen. Um, you should be able to ac access additional resources, so you can see those made available there. In the second half of the webinar, we'll have a chance to get around to, to some of the questions you've been asking. Just to reiterate, reiterate that our panel are very keen to make this a good interactive session. I think it's a good time. Let's meet our panel. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Amy Foss, uh, National Director of Procurement and Plant Operations with Watermark Retirement Communities. Um, she's an expert in the field of procurement and contracts with over 25 years of experience um, with across industries including high tech, engineering, uh, seniors housing. Um, she's worked for uh, Fluor Enterprises, Razorfish, and of course Watermark Retirement Communities. And she's achieved hundreds of millions in cost savings leading teams to implement sourcing tools for direct and indirect spending. So that's really interesting there. And that's only kind of part of the story when it comes to Amy. But I think it's going to be really interesting hearing some of the journey that they've been on and give her a chance to share her experience. We're also extremely delighted to welcome Gerard Dehan, uh, Global Chief Revenue and Marketing Officer with Determine. Um, Gerard is a, a, a bit of a tech pioneer in, in spend management, and he, again, 25 years of, of experience in executive leadership, sales management, global strategic marketing experience uh, in his role. Uh, and it really, Gerard, uh, he, he's been at many of the sort of major tech corporations and really has a ex really interesting kind of market view on, on what is going to drive this particular area of tech forward and what are some of the challenges that some of the customers he's, uh, he works with, what, what has he seen them tackling, and how, how is he helping them move forward? So we're very keen to welcome Gerard and to hear the determined perspective on, on this particular um, area of technology. I'm also delighted to welcome a colleague of mine here at Procurement Leaders, uh, Richard Alaya. Uh, Richard is a senior analyst here. Um, he's got a background in category management, product development, data and analytics, and he's, uh, his, his research focuses on identifying opportunities to digitize category intelligence. So he's going to offer a particularly uh, kind of a particular start slant on this which we think is going to build the story today and we're very pleased to have Richard along for the ride okay so with that um, we'll just uh, move on to um, hearing the first piece from watermark so uh, Amy let's bring you in Amy um, thank you thank you for joining us today maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your organization please 
So uh, Watermark Retirement Communities is a senior housing management company and we have uh, over 50 communities throughout the nation and over 6,000 employees. It's a really exciting industry to be in and I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about our journey as you stated earlier. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Amy. Okay, so I'd also like to, uh, to invite uh, Gerard. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about um, Determine and, and the journey that you guys are on. Well, I think about myself, you've done a lot, that's, it. that's enough, you know, I've been in business for 25 years and you, in one minute you, you gave a pretty good uh, resume of what I've done in, in my life. So quickly, uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank Amy for joining us today uh, on this webinar. Um, it's really a pleasure for me and, and, and a honor for, for Determined to have such a, a dedicated customer and what I like to call an ambassador. So again, thank you, Amy. Uh, this is great uh, to have you today. Um, it is true that um, since day one, um, placing the customer at the center of everything we do has been uh, essential in our strategy and, and, and part of our DNA. And um, I will show you at the end of, of the short intro a slide with a, with a series, of, a list of uh, customers coming from all around the world, uh, from different industries or, or sizes. And, and they all understood the value of uh, the DCP platform, which takes, uh, I'm French, I'm going to say it in French, la crème de la crème, la crème de la crème, of the three solutions um, uh, which, uh, which made uh, the term in. So uh, Yasta for um, the sourcing brought this expertise, this expertise, uh, Selectica for the uh, contract life cycle management, and BPAC for the uh, e-procurement that makes of course, determined in uh, 2015. Um, quickly, where um, you know, I always say that determined is a kind of a best kept secret. So um, we achieved uh, mostly uh, around 28 million dollars, more a little bit more than 30 million dollar uh, euros last year. We are around 270 employees around the world. We have uh, uh, we are the Nasdaq, um, and we have offices in four uh, countries. Um, the, the headquarters in Carmel, Carmel, Indiana, not the other one by the sea. Um, some offices in Atlanta, in Paris, in Aix-en-Provence, pretty nice place. Who people who know France, it's uh, very nice offices as well. Uh, London and Odessa. Very quickly about the platform. And again, we we are here to help our customers, our clients, to achieve their objectives which can be you know, supply performance, supply intelligence, finding new fields of savings or, or helping them to improve their procurement processes, taking the you know, advantage of a, uh, an integrated full suite from spend, spend analysis through sourcing and, and procurement. And using, using as well a, a, a determined great asset, which is the BPM tool, um, uh, you know, sitting on top of the cloud, uh, the, the cloud platform, um, which will help all of you to, to capture your process and insert it into the tool. Um, I said very quick intro, so I determine, you know, customer matters. And um, I tell you, this is a, a, sh a short uh, list of uh, uh, you know, customers, we have uh, 280 customers around the world, just, just naming here PepsiCo, you know, uh, Valeo in France, uh, uh, Energy uh, Australia, Monoprix, Unisys, Marriott, Biogen, Bombardier, you know, all these, these customers coming from uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the U.S., in, uh, in Europe, in various countries as well, um, in other places uh, in the world. So one thing I want to I want to add and, and you know conclude with this slide is we work very very closely with our customers. We have a high level of relationship. Just as an example, we run two user groups per year with them, and 80% of the roadmap. I repeat, 80% of the roadmap is built with customers and customers' requests. With that, back to you, Steve. 
Okay, thank you very much, Gerard. Um, and, and what a great list you've got there uh, as well, and, and, and some impressive stats to back that up. Okay, so um, so now um, let's hear a little bit around around the journey that you guys are, are going through at Watermark, Amy. We're very keen to kind of hear about some of the successes you've had. Um, we, we looked at this. We were talking about what was exciting about this journey. We wanted to look at contract processing, vendor additions and deletions, capital expense, tracking and budgets, and rouge room turn spend. Um, maybe you could just at this point just give us a little bit of a, a, a kick off into this into what you guys were doing and what the kind of start of this project was okay sure thanks Steve so when I started here at watermark um, just about two years ago uh, there was a really great need for a contract management process uh, we started with um, processing contracts through a um, email inbox and that was uh, found to be very cumbersome and things were getting missed and it was known as the black hole here at our company. So I was first tasked with finding a contract management tool and I uh, used uh, Determine at two previous companies in um, supplier management and in contract management and so of course I wanted to bring that here. But in <clears throat> evaluating the system we discovered that um, under their new platform, they um, had everything integrated in, which was um, all sourcing, uh, contract management, supplier management, P2P. So uh, we made the collective decision here with upper management that we would uh, purchase the entire modular suite. So we began about a year ago um, rolling out or activating the different modules. And first we went live with the um, the onboarding, supplier onboarding process, then we went on to contract management, and then we went on to P2P. So I can talk about um, the first issue that we had in contract processing, um, processing. So as I said, with the black hole, all the missing key, key pieces of information, you know, we couldn't get um, contracts executed in time, and of course it caused a lot of delays. Um, the next issue that we were um, being affected by um, was uh, we didn't have the ability to be able to onboard our suppliers quick enough and so we started to um, go through the process of, of re-engineering how we onboarded vendors. I'll talk in detail about contracts. Um, they, w when we activated the solution um, uh, several months ago for supplier onboarding and then contract management, it um, it really made a huge impact here. Um, we were able to um, get rid of uh, leave, like old forms that we had that people had to fill out in order to um, make processes happen properly. Um, we were able to integrate in um, DocuSign in, into our system. So um, we now have a full suite where everything is all um, viewable by all of our communities at any time where they can see where a supplier sits in the system, where um, a contract sits in the system, you know, all the, the recs, the POs, and invoices. Um, so um, the main issues that we had with vendor additions and deletions uh, was the um, manual forms that everyone had to fill out. So the process was they would have to fill out a form, email it to our AP department, and then they'd have to wait for the supplier to be added in our back-end system. Now our communities, all the directors at the communities, are able to um, start the vendor creation process, and we have a three-step approval process within our organization. So we have someone at um, someone in procurement, we have our determined expert, and then we have somebody in AP that looks at that uh, creation of a, of a supplier uh, vendor. And so it's um, traceable, auditable. Um, so we really love that system and we're able to um, create a supplier within 24 hours. So on um, the SIM module that, that we rolled out, not only did uh, we get rid of all of the manual paperwork and and all that, we were able to, through the Determined platform, there's all these great features, they're called tags, that we were able to start tagging all of our suppliers and now we can do great analytics on them. Um, we were also able to um, uh, 
um, reduce a lot of wasted operational time. So uh, that's really beneficial here to us. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, we also have um, integrated in the capital expense tracking and budgeting in the system. So we uh, used to track all of our budgets through manual spreadsheets, and we had one person that would uh, go through the whole approval process on all POs and make sure that every invoice got paid properly. Now we're loading in the um, capital expense and our operational expenses so in the determined platform. Anyone who's creating a requisition or a PO or processing an invoice, they can see um, how much is left in each of those budgets at the time. So whenever they're making commitments on behalf of the company, they know where they, they stand in their, um, in their budgeting process. Now on the P2P side of it, um, th this is probably going to be the most impactful to the company in the end uh, because we used to have um, disparate systems. So we had um, a system that requisitions and POs were created in, and then we had a system that invoices were processed in. So they didn't talk to each other. There was no continuity, you know, no visibility, no reporting, anything on that. So now with the P2P solution, we have REC to PO to pay, so REC to PO to invoice. So now everything matches. We can see when someone creates a requisition, it flips into a PO. We know when the invoice comes in, it, it's already been pre-approved and pre-coded. Um, we also integrated in ReadSoft into the system. So we have everything's uh, all electronic. And um, so um, invoices get scanned into ReadSoft. They automatically get set into determine. They automatically, if, if everything matches, it just, Three-way matches um, automatically, and then it goes to get paid in our back-end system. Um, it's, uh, for our company, it's been game-changing. It's really um, changing the way that we're internally doing our operations for um, back-end. Um, and it's really successful, and I, I couldn't be happier. We love Determine. Um, they've been a great support team for us as well. So, on the last slide, I'm going to talk about the rogue room for, um, spend that we've had um, at our company. And, you know, it's not really purposeful, but the, the, the issues that we identified were that throughout the organization, because our um, communities have a different look and feel in, in every state, we had um, just varying spends in each of them on um, any kind of a, we call them room turns or room renovations. And so what we try to do um, through the system is we created some carts that um, the communities can now use that will allow them to just click on a cart that has the specific items that, you know, they are able to buy to, at that location. We standardized on all the look and feel of all of our flooring and, and our fixtures and, and, and that throughout the room. So now um, it's more consistent design throughout all of our communities and more consistent spend. And um, we did that through um, creating these carts within Determine. Um, so just to, to talk about um, the impact of it's making on the users here, you know, it's completely changing the way <laughs> that we were processing any, any kind of paperwork or anything here because now everyone knows they just go to Determine to do everything. They don't have to think about going into different systems and, and, and all that. And, um, you know, the savings that we're realizing here, you know, we, you know, have just gone live throughout this past year. So doing analytics on that are, are, are going to begin next year. But, you know, we can already see significant savings in, in, in all the standardization that we've done um, throughout all this, you know, consistency and efficiencies that we've gained. Um, the, back to the shopping carts, you know, um, in the system, you, the system is, typically has a PO cart and a rec cart. We asked Determine if we could um, come up with these three specialized carts, and then we actually came up with more ideas to do even more. So we've pre-programmed all the carts to have pre-coding in them. So it's really created a lot of um, um, efficiency in the way people are processing these different tasks. And um, so it, it's, it's been great for us. So I'm, the savings are going to be in the millions, I know. And, and you know, we're going to be running all that reporting next year. But 
you know, it's, um, it's been really great for us. In addition to all the savings, it's also given us, you know, such great results that um, we are able now to have our employees spend more time with our residents and work on other types of programs that um, they didn't have the time for before because of this tool that we've rolled out. So thank you for allowing me to speak, Steve. Great stuff. And what a fantastic story and really interesting to kind of hear the results as well. You know, what, often we, we always get asked, how do you make the business case and how do you trace ROI and how do you see the outcomes? And it's really interesting to see that you guys have been able to kind of trace that through. Fantastic stuff. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Amy. Steve, do, do, yeah, yeah, excuse me. Do, do you mind if I ask Amy just, just two questions here? Uh, would you do the project the same way again? Oh, for sure. <laughs> My entire team, we, we couldn't be happier. You know, there's obviously when I'm, I've rolled out systems at other companies before too, and you know, you always have, there's little glitches and little hiccups and stuff that you go through. It's natural when you are obviously integrating multiple systems and, in, and, and, and actually activating new systems that have never been there. So there's a little bit of a training that, that, you know, takes place, but oh, for sure, that we are everyone who's going through the whole process with us. And again, you know, we have 500. We actually started with only having 500 users. I think we actually have about 750 users now. And um, every, you know, everyone, you know, they we get so much positive feedback on how this is really, um, you know, changing the way they're doing their their work every day, and they're really happy with it. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and another quick one. So. What what are you, you the key advices that you would give on the people on the phone uh, who are about to to launch a, a um, spend you know spend management project today? So I would say to if you're integrating in with a back end system, so, so we have Lawson as our back end system. Um, the one thing that I didn't really anticipate was. The, the cost that would be involved with on the Lawson side, you know, the determined side's been wonderful and, and integrations happening beautifully. But um, it's <clears throat> I would advise people to just when you're reporting what the cost is going to be to management to make sure that you you keep that in your in your actual overall cost and make sure that you you get a full mapping of of what your back end supplier or whoever you're integrating in with is going to charge you. Thanks, okay. Amy. Back to you, Steve. Thanks very much, Gerard. I mean, good questions as well. Really, uh, you know, it, it's important to hear that side of the story as well. So thank you very much for bringing that to life. Okay, I'd like to um, introduce, um, uh, I guess, a bit more of a kind of broader view of what we're seeing in the market here at Procurement Leaders. So I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, Richard, uh, who's a senior analyst here, to talk a little bit through, I guess, some of the findings that we've come across. So, so Richard, I'm going to pass over to you now. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, today, I would like to present a view on how procurement can source more effectively from research. So, from research, what I've gathered is that most organizations tend to carry out this um, end-to-end -end processes in, in source-to-pay in silos. So, some conduct source-to-contract, purchase-to-pay, supplier management without any link between them. But Ideally, the future is more an agile source to pay landscape where all the three are interlinked. So it's going to help procurement move beyond cost savings to value adding and supply innovation. So how would procurement do this? I think procurement should lead the implementation of a digitalization project that would um, connect all the three processes together. That leads us to the question, how do we go about this? Uh, first, it will be important for procurement to understand the complexity of the source to pay process, which will allow them to be able to pinpoint the best tools, technologies that will help them achieve this. So from research, I've come up with an effective practice on how you as a procurement professional can assess your source to pay processes and find recommendations for them. So I'm listing three core components in analyzing or assessing your processes, people, IT infrastructure, and tools. So for example, we quickly take spend analysis. As a procurement professional, you need to ask yourself, you know, how difficult, how hard, how long is it for you to gather and categorize historical transaction data? You also need to ask yourself, 
where the transactional data is stored. It is stored on multiple on-premises ERP software, on a single ERP software, or on a cloud software. Do you have an integrated ERP tool or a standalone tool for analysis? Do you ask yourself these questions? The next step is, okay, what technology can I implement that would help me be more effective, for example, at categorizing um, and analyzing spend data? Then you look at artificial intelligence, for example. If we take natural language processing, machine learning, they can automatically classify pure and invoice data in a matter of seconds, which saves um, enough time, which saves time for the category managers to focus on more strategic things. The second question you ask yourself is, what infrastructure do I have in place that can enable this tool to be implemented? Um, I will recommend a cloud infrastructure for so many reasons, but the easiest to point out is it's easy to integrate, it's easy to add new technology, and it's also quite cheap now to uh, um, implement and scalable. So an another interesting activity in post contract is running of RFXs, running events, e-auctions. So the question is, you know, um, for example, you ask yourself a simple question. Supplier responses, you know, are they stored in a central repository when you're carrying a, um, an RFE ev uh, event? Do your staff have a tool that automatically runs these events to save them time? And if they don't, you can identify technology. So, for example, if you're looking at artificial intelligence, we have some technologies, machine learning, um, decision management, natural language processing. These will help assemble RFXs and automatically send them out to suppliers and evaluate their responses. So we move on to a second core process in the source to pay cycle, which is purchase to pay. Um, from research, I think what I've been able to gather is that one of the pains that category managers or procurement professionals face is updating the catalog content, that it reflects what's really happening in the business real time, changes in how purchases are being done by the business. A tool, if you implement an AI tool with recommendation and prediction algorithms that can identify patterns based on historical purchases and create new product lists, which automatically update the tools. Um, but in order, for, again, in order for you to have that tool successfully implemented, you need to understand what, what is the underlying IT infrastructure. If you have a cloud base, you can easily add a, an artificial intelligence bolt on or adopt um, a source to pay solution that would do this for you. Um, another pain that is also talked about a lot by procurement professionals is payment on time. You know, how can we pay our suppliers on time? With the adoption of blockchain technology, where you have algorithms that validate transactions, they can automatically pass those validation transactions to account payables, and those um, transactions are paid on time, which eliminates the whole um, AP staff pr process. You have to scan an invoice, compare them against the goods received. And then we move to supplier management, which is often overlooked in the source to pay process, because most, from research, most procurement professionals focus on source to contract and purchase to pay. Supplier management is what would drive innovation. It will help suppliers, or help procurement professionals when in terms of negotiation go beyond just trying to squeeze suppliers on price or look at things like supplier innovation with an integrated ERP system and they are able to see how, suppliers are able to see how procurement um, businesses are purchases, purchasing goods and services, and they can now recommend maybe new products or better ways that they can reduce, they, they, they can offer um, better prices to procurement. So the question most of procurement professionals will be asking themselves, okay, you've talked about recall processes, how technology can bring them together, and how technology can add value in terms of source to pay. But the next question is, okay, wh where's the best place to begin in starting a source to pay transformation program. Um, so from research, I would say we will start with spend management. Now just to point out that spend management, 
will not give you the full benefits of the source to pay, but it's the starting place and it can deliver savings in a short time. So as you can see, spent management is also very critical when you look at the, the flow of source to pay. With inadequate spend visibility, procurement professionals, category buyers, and category managers, buyers, would, would, would go out negotiating and coming up with a category plan or with a lack of data, not really understanding how the company is actually purchasing, not knowing the suppliers, and there's a lot of leakage in terms of saving. So one of the key recommendations I'll make from that is for category professionals to set a clear plan for them to digitize spend, that's looking at how they can create a spend cube, gather all the spend into a single source database, categorize the spend, and start making actionable insights based on that. So moving on to the last slide, which is what changes can procurement professionals make in the short term that will have an impact. So from research, I'm just going to list a few. One is automation, and some of the drivers behind that automation is procurement professionals can look at implementing RPA technology to automate the creation and approval of POs. Standardization, hire change management team to streamline source to contract, purchase to pay, and supply management end-to-end -end processes. Internal compliance, which is most times overlooked, is to put a standard PO template and PO approval processes in place that helps organizations um, speed up payment approval. Spend management, as I said earlier on, so most times you know, it's easy for now for procurement to implement a spend data cube, and it's easy to get analytical tools off the shelf, and there are a number of spend management solution providers. Risk management, if there's no process in place, it's hard to implement a tool to help procurement professionals manage third-party supplier risk. So my recommendation is first hire a risk professional to implement an end-to-end -end process for managing supplier risk, and then based on that process, you can adopt a tool that suits that. So key takeaways, as the year comes to an end and we move into 2019, I strongly recommend that procurement professionals, number one priority should be looking at the existing technology and how they can use that to deliver business value going forward. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Richard, and, and, and really useful for you to kind of encapsulate some of those recommendations. There. So thank you very much for that. You guys, the audience, you have been entering your questions. Um, thank you very much for doing so. Um, we, we will now have a chance to move to the Q&A portion of today's session. Um, I know you, have a chance, you want to have a chance to speak to our panelists. If you do have any questions, you should be able to see the question box there. Please do enter your questions in there if you have anything you'd like to put to our panel. Um, but Amy, I'm going to come to you first. Um, we have have a couple that have come in. So let's start with um, how could I improve easily um, at payment on time? That's the, that was the way that the questions come in there. Can you, can you maybe um, help talk our listener through any thoughts that you've had on, on how to think about that, that, that issue of paying on time? Yes, for sure. Uh, on um, our supplier records, we um, have instituted a policy where before you're creating a supplier, well, always a W-9 has to be attached, and we need to make sure at that time that the supplier is being created, they're being um, tagged appropriately as a um, either a one-time use only supplier or a legacy supplier or um, a sales use tax supplier. Uh, we ensure that at the time of the creation, we are deciding what the payment terms are so that when the supplier record gets fed into our back-end system, it's tagged appropriately. Here we have to, when residents move out, we have to pay them within a certain time. Um, it's a law. And so, you know, if, if someone's not creating a supplier properly at the beginning of, of the supplier creation and they're tagged uh, net 30 terms, but yet they should have been a net due upon receipt check with, uh, created at the time they're getting paid, then obviously, you know, that's going to cause a problem for us. So for us, that's, uh, that's how we improve our payment on time. Fantastic. Some very useful tips there. I, I'm gonna, I, I don't mean to quick fire this at you, Amy, but I do have another one that's come in that I think is quite useful, and it's um, 
maybe a bit more sp- a bit specific as well. Um, a- a one of our listeners is interested in what supplier tags are being used at Watermark. Can you give us a bit of an outline there of, of, of how you guys are approaching that? Sure. Uh, so like I just mentioned the few that we do. So um, when we started with our legacy suppliers, we had 27,000 suppliers. When we uh, started determine we didn't want to bring all 27,000 in. So we tagged the ones that we sorted through that we did want to keep as the legacy suppliers. So when you go into um, and start a contract or a PO or whatever, you can see that that supplier was uh, tagged as a legacy supplier. So we know it's an active good supplier to use. And also we tag them with the one-time use only. So usually, you know, if we're paying to an estate of a resident that moves out, you know, we're not going to want to keep that supplier record in our system forever. So we're able to run reports on just one-time use only suppliers and purge out those suppliers from our system so it doesn't bog down any of our systems. Uh, We also like to track sales use tax. So we tag them as either a sales use tax a supplier or a non-sales use tax supplier so we can run um, special reports on any use tax that we need to pay that wasn't collected at the time that we were billed. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, Gerard, I've been very keen to hear from you as well um, and, and to kind of bring you into this discussion. I think there's an interesting question that's come in. Maybe you can have a crack at it. Um, I, I, the question is, I would like to understand the data migration strategy and how P2P can coexist when we have uh, an existing uh, ERP. Can you give us a bit of a, a view on that data mi- migration strategy piece, please? <laughs> it's funny. <clears throat> 20 years in business, and I always have, I always have the same questions. So, um, well, you know, uh, P2P vendors are been working been working with uh, ERPs for ages, and we we connect with them, we interface with them, we download, upload data uh, with with ERPs every day. This is part of our <laughs> of our job every day. But when I look in, in in let's say in the recent years, the trend has been to kind of a surround the ERP with in, enabling. Uh, P2P capabilities, um, even leveraging the underlying, uh, underlying ERP building blocks. We have a, a great case study uh, in, in France called Arkema, big big company, uh, something like 12 billion revenue, um, uh, lots of suppliers. And, and what we've done for them, you know, the, we've done a kind of a catalog management tool which comes on top of SAP ERP. Uh, to provide a, a better UI and UX without going through um, a new system implementation. And uh, Archima wanted to keep the, uh, the ERP as the, the master system for AP and finance system. Um, and, and also because SAP SRM was, you know, stopped as well. So um, the other thing I, I, I want to tell you here is that uh, some customers and or, or companies are, are going even beyond that and, and simply cut out ERP from their P2P process, mainly because of, of you know, lower performance on UI and UX. And they, they create, as I said, so this is our job every day, we create interfaces with, with their ERP for a process that cannot be done via their dedicated system uh, payment, for instance. That's, in, in a nutshell, in a one-minute answer, this is, this is my, uh, my point of view. But you covered a lot of ground, and that's really useful. Hopefully that gets to the bottom of our listeners' answer. I would like to, though, I, I think this is something possibly, Richard, that you can add to as well. I, I, I know we've had a lot of questions in for Amy, so we're going to dive back into those in a moment. But maybe you could talk a little bit about that data migration strategy piece and some of the things that you've been seeing. So maybe you can bring that to life for us. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yes, from a lot of industry research that I've been doing, most of our members have been really skeptical about how can they migrate data from their on-premises ERP system to data in the cloud. They're often scared about security, data quality. But from research, they're what we call HCIs, which is hybrid cloud infrastructure vendors. So essentially what they do is they take part of your data from your on-premise ERP system and migrate it or copy it to the cloud. And then you can gradually test it for accuracy, for security, and it's very quick, easy to implement. Most times that could be done within two to three days. And so the whole idea is instead of you moving your entire data to the cloud, you move a portion of it 
you test it for accuracy and for security, and if that keeps on working, then you can gradually move your data. So that, that's the solution for people who are stuck and wondering what's the best data strategy they can use migrating their data to the cloud. I'll pass it back to Steve now. Much appreciated, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, so let's, Amy, let's come back to you with another question here. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of conflate uh, a, a couple of things here. So we'll, we'll, go for, we'll go for first, maybe we'll ask you um, what would be your top three must-dos, if you like, for success in the S2P space. Can you offer us a bit of that, you know, some, some kind of key hints, things you learned maybe that you think would be important to, to, uh, to getting this right when it comes to S2P? Yes, I think the most important thing is to have uh, management support, some, you know, support from the very top C-level people in the company who are really pushing your program out to all your users. Um, you know, that makes rolling anything out a lot easier. Um, I think getting input from all the disciplines within the organization, you know, meeting with multiple departments and getting their feedback and making sure that they're really thinking about um, how they want a system to be, not just replicate what current processes are. Um, think of the dream picture that they want it to be. And then I'd say the third thing would be having a really good training um, activation process in place. Um, really, really um, think about how you want to activate your system and, and what's going to make the most sense. You know, have the approvers trained first and then have the users trained next, et cetera. If, and, if you don't mind, Steve. Just, oh yes, Gerard, please. Steve, I, 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 just, yeah, I just would like to add something. You know, when when I look at all the the customers that we've been working with for you know several years, and the I would say the best in in class um, are the ones who spend time talking to the various business units before starting the project. What I mean is the the various key users and key. Uh, stakeholders like finance, legal, IT, even you know the one who's going to bring data to this this uh, procurement organization, even including marketing and other guys. So when when the CPO works with all the all, all those stakeholders uh, before starting the project, I tell you, it's it's really really an asset to be successful uh, with this project. Ah, great. Well, that's re that was really interesting to kind of to kind of build on that. I I, I just I don't know if this is mainly. I, maybe you tell me if this if if, if uh, there's anything you can add here. But another question that came in was, uh, can you share some of the lessons you learned when implementing the solution? Um, Amy, I, I know you just kind of ran through. I guess your 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 kind of tips for success. But was there anything that maybe that was challenging that you learned from that you you could share here that that maybe other people could kind of think about when they're approaching the same project? Anything else you'd like to kind of build on in that sense? Yeah, on this particular project, I would say um, asking for more help and not uh, just realizing that you know I'm not I'm one person and I, you know I have a very small team of really great people, but you know asking for help from the other business leads to to pitch in on everything from you know collaborating to what the system is going to look like to helping with training that that really is um, probably I think is my biggest lesson learned. Like I can't do it all. <laughs> And it's good to be, it's important to kind of be honest about that. And I think it's very, you know, a lot of people will, you know, who are listening, I'm sure will be faced with the idea, you know, the, the problem of having to do a lot with, with limited resources. That is the nature of how, how things work. So I, I think that's an important one to, to, to bring to the fore. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, my team was able to implement this system. We don't even have an IT department. And I just want it just to impress on everyone that point that, we were able to do it, you know, three people in my department um, to roll out this system for, um, to, you know, now 750 users and activate it and um, implement, we're not only implementing, configuring, working with the, the project management team at, at Determine. And I mean, I think that just speaks huge volumes because any other company I've ever worked for, I've had an IT department do, you know, at least 50% of the work that we are doing. And I, I it just, just, proves that the service that you're getting from Determine is amazing, the project management, the help, the support that they've given us, and then the ease of the use of the tool. So I think that's a very important key point to make. Thank you. Uh, Gerard, maybe you, uh, you, I think you had something to add. Yeah, just, just for the, uh, the folks on the phone who are uh, deploying globally, um, you know, <laughs> People are different in different countries as well. So you need to think about how to align 
global processes and standards as much as possible. But, you know, we all keeping it, need to keep in mind that some Again, some parts of the world are, are have different regulations, different taxes, um, you know, different organization, different uh, way of gathering the, the data as well. So it it requires some variance in in, in process flow. So I, I would I would also say that you 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 guys need to understand the the local wide thinking of the global consequences. Um, Gerard, I do want to come with another question to you that I think I think you might uh, be able to offer an interesting perspective on. Uh, we've been asked, what are the top three pain points in the STP process? We've we, we've we've talked a lot about what you have to do, and, and it's been a very positive story. But maybe you can give a bit of an idea of what you've seen. You've got a lot of experience in seeing what customers are coming up against. What do you think are the main pain points when it comes to the STP process? Well. Um I would say again I'm going to come back to the to the uh, the first point I made is that you need to distinguish between what is immediately needed and what you eventually want to achieve so you know there there's a, a saying in English you need to crawl to walk and run so an an approach in, in in everything you do during the the specification and planning phases you need to take time to to plan your project so that's that's the first the first thing it helps to focus on what's critical and what is possible first, and then what is possible afterwards. So for me, there, there's diff- different stages. And the first stage, again, is to spend time with the users because this, th- they're going to be the people who are going to use and, and, and adopt your, your solution. That's, that's one thing. So as I said, involve the internal participants. Um, I would also say that... Um, if you have a, a tool which brings you a great user interface, it's going to really help the adoption because this is, this is what we all want. Amy wants adoption. I want adoption. Everybody wants adoption uh, to, uh, of this tool. That's my three things. Fantastic. That's really kind of helped illuminate that, and hopefully that answers our, our, our listeners' questions. Amy, I've got a couple for you. Um, guys, we've got about 10 minutes left, but um, there are questions flooding in. If you do have a question for us, now's a good time to put it into the question box. But Amy, I mentioned I was going to come to you with a question. Um, I'm going to read this one out. How does Amy handle COIs, contracts, and agreements for vendors? Can you help um, provide a bit of insight there, please, Amy? Sure. So COIs, we can handle them in multiple ways within the system. Through the supplier portal, we can have the uh, suppliers at the time of their um, invite into the portal. They can upload their W9 and their COI. We also um, track the COIs within the contracts module, and the contracts and agreements are handled through the um, contract module system. Um, so a supplier is onboarded. Their COI is in the system. It's passed along through the contract approval process, uh, and then the contract is um, we we built in true API integration into the system. It goes into DocuSign, it gets signed and emailed out to everyone from DocuSign, and then fed right back into Determine, and then it's all housed there in that portal. And you can track the COIs by expiration date too, so you can have an auto notice sent from the system to tell the supplier. Uh, that your COI is expiring and we need we require you to upload a more current one for us. Great stuff. Thanks for going into, to, into a bit of depth on that. Um, I, another question, I think you touched upon this um, in the slide deck, but maybe you could help bring it to life. Can, we've had a few questions around um, key project metrics. Um, and I want, I, I want to come to Amy first. Um, and then, Gerard, I'd love to hear from you for maybe this thought around um, what metrics are going to help show ROI for procurement activities. But, Amy, let's, let's, let's come to Amy first with this. Uh, can you maybe um, help illuminate a bit more for our listeners around, uh, around key project me- metrics? What did you start off with? How did you, you know, think about success towards the end? Well, you know, I guess I would just say that, you know, Thinking about how we're we're activating the system and then seeing everything that was available to us within the system, you know, it changed throughout the process of integration. Um, the the tagging feature is amazing. Um, we can get so much information from that. Um, we also, you know, we we tie all the way back to the commodity level on on the um, the services and goods that we're. Uh, purchasing, so we're able to get a lot of analytics on that now. Um, 
I mean, that would probably be what I would say is really what we're tra- tracking and we're going to be able to get the best metrics on. Absolutely. And, and, you, and, and of course, you painted the picture for us of how you kind of trace that through in, in terms of how your users were using it, where the adoption rates were, et cetera. So I, I guess that's kind of a, a, a broader picture. Thanks for expanding on that. Um, Gerard, I, I did say I kind of wanted to come to you with that as well. Um, the question that came in, I'm going to read it, is what's the best way or format to show ROI for procurement activities? This is always a challenge, right, Gerard? How, what do you think people should be thinking about here? Yeah, very, very, very challenging. Um, what, one thing I, I, I want to add to the, the previous question, which is linked to this one as well, is, is if you don't get a great quality of data and um, a pretty good integration of your data, you know, everything you do, that's going to be very, very difficult to show any, any ROI or any results if the original data is not good. So this is so important to, to get a, a pretty good spend analysis of your categories and your data before you, you, you launch any, any project. So, you know, in, and linked to that, for me, um, I would say that you need to work with, with finance to set the, the procurement savings uh, and objectives and also agree on the, the, the calculation methodology that you're going to apply and, and get finance, you know, on board with that because uh, otherwise, you know, <laughs> finance will never, never agree on the, on the, the let's say, the, the rough savings that you're going to bring to them. So then um, I will also... Um, you know, record the savings and 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 challenge the savings against targets that you you have set for you yourself and your team, and and again verify and approve those savings with your finance team. For me, get your finance with you on the same boat. That's one of the most important objectives to be sure to to show an ROI for procurement activities. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sharon. Of course, absolutely bringing everybody on board and making sure that you're agreed on what you're going to deliver and how. I mean, that, that, that feels critical. Uh, Richard, I'd love to kind of bring you into this. And just to, again, just to expand on that idea of, of demonstrating ROI. Can you, can, you, can you build on Gerard's points there? Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yes, based on my own experience in the industry, I think one of the KPIs to show is spend on the contract. Because when you have a large spend on the contract, that means you have the opportunity to actually promote supplier innovation, supplier enablement, which is very, very key to adding value to the business in the long term. I'm going to pass it back to Steve. Absolutely, and always a challenge to, to bring more spend under contract. But, um, I mean, sometimes the question is how much is the right amount to have? So, you know, I guess that's, that's something for organizations to be thinking about. Um, a question that's come in, Amy, I'd like to, to potentially throw this one your way, um, relating to spend analytics. The question, I'll read it out to you. Um, any advice on which type of taxonomy should be used to get a good spend analysis? Should taxonomy be driven internally or externally using standard te- taxonomy such as UNSPSC? Um, any thoughts on that? Anything you, any insight you can offer us there around the spend analysis taxonomy piece, Amy? Sure. Well, I think a combination of various different approaches is good. I mean, we we actually are um, using the standard UN SPSC codes in in the system. We've um, activated all of those, and we're tying them through all the commodities and every purchase that we're doing. So, you know, we we bought the analytics module as well, so we're going to be able to get some really deep dive analytics within the tool. Um, you know, again, we've just gone live this year, so. Um, any of our historical data is in our old systems, but, you know, a year from now, we will be able to get a lot of it. I mean, in, in addition to the UNSDC codes and commodities, and I know I keep saying it, the tags that are available in Determine, I don't, you know, I don't know any other systems that have this ability, but we have hundreds of tags in there. We tag everything from whatever, you know, whatever seems important to my department that we can run all these different analytics on. So, I mean, a combination is, is what I suggest. Absolutely, and that, it, it seems like a sensible approach. Hopefully, I mean, that's, thank you for being candid, and hopefully that gives us our, our our audience a, a bit of insight there. I, I, I'm going to feel like I'm bombard, bombarding you a little bit here, Amy, but I'm going to come with another question. Um, we've been asked around whether you can offer some quick wins for STP digitization. I mean, you talked about um, the need to kind of ask for help and for stakeholder engagement, but I guess when we're thinking about kind of 
you know, what you can do and what people can kind of go away and think about that they might be able to do to kind of move the dial, even if it isn't undertaking a, a larger project? Any, anything you think that can help them kind of, like we, like we say, to get some quick wins and move, move the organization forward? Any, any insight there? Well, I think not necessarily super quick wins, but just important wins. Building in the API integration into a tool is always very beneficial. You know, having the ability to have somebody upload a contract or start, start a contract template and do that all electronically through API technology going in and back at, and going out and back into the system, you know, that's a quick win. You know, like I mentioned before, ReadSoft with the invoices that are being read through OCR technology where humans don't have to index invoices anymore. It's, um, those are very important wins in my mind. And also on the supplier side, I think for us, something that's been really important is we built in some questionnaires within the supplier portal where when a supplier uh, signs up with us, we ask them to answer some questions. We want to know if they have senior sensitivity training. We'd like to know if they um, are a minority, woman-owned, small business company, um, if they have any eco and green programs in place. You know, for us to be able to look at the type of suppliers we're working with, that's very important. And those are really quick wins that we never had before in the past. So that would be my input. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, uh, Richard, is this something you can, you can build on for us around, around quick wins? Thanks very much, Steve. Um, yes, because I was actually involved in a source to pay transformation project, and the quick win was implementing a spend analytics tool. So it was all about capturing our spend um, and being able to report that to date um, to senior management and look at our top top ten suppliers, our tail spend, and create strategies based on that. Okay, I'll pass it back to Steve. Thank you, Richard. I mean, yeah, and we, we talked around, you know, we, we mentioned the importance of spend analytics there as well. So we have time for a couple more questions. I'm going to breeze through these um, guys. So maybe, um, Gerard, I, I can pick up one with, very quickly with you that we've been asked. How can we use the new trends of technology to improve our function? Gerard, that's a very broad question, but I mean, maybe if I can help, are there, are there any emerging technologies or any new pieces of uh, new, new advances in software that you think our listeners should be really focusing on in order to make some gains here? Yeah, so of course, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence in, to achieve mostly four objectives. One is, is, the first is a better classification, so place items into specific categories, reduce costs, um, you know, perform classification that, that, that would be very difficult to achieve without AI. The second point is recommendation, so give users the best, uh, best options to choose, so, you know, like speed up the process, like task automate, automation, uh, optimize decisions, and, and obviously share knowledge as well. The third, you know, point would be prediction. So um, I would call that like drive operational decisions, um, you know, help the, the users to anticipate, to make better decisions. Of, of course, again, to increase the savings and, and improve the visibility and, and, and lower the risk. And, and the last point would be... Uh, what we, we call in, in AI natural language, so understand plain English, so, you know, chatbots, chat uh, uh, natural conversations, and, and with that increase uh, user adoption and build um, knowledge, uh, knowledge bases. You know, we, we run a, um, a short survey. We ask customers, uh, what do you see as the primary client value proposition of your AI uh, enhanced solutions? And, and you know what? The first three were, um, the the top three were better decisions, better decisions, you know, enabling employees to, in, to increase the probability of, of doing good business and, and getting good business outcomes and reduce the probability of bad business outcomes. The second one was productivity, enabling em employees to be more efficient in their activities. And the last one, not a surprise, cost savings, you know, automating business processes and activities. Fantastic. I, I'm aware we're about to run over, but just one final thing for you, Amy. Um, any, any quick glimpse you can give us into where you guys are heading next or anything, any, anything that you're particularly excited about that, that's coming down the track for you guys? Oh, yes. Uh, so next year we will start implementing the um, source to pay module um, with uh, Determine, and as we're also implementing the project management module, and that is really going to be exciting for us. So. We are going to have all P2P um, 
100% live and everyone active um, this month. It's com being completed. So yeah, that's our, our next goal is to do those next modules, and we're really excited about that. That's pretty cool. I mean, you guys are a small team, but the, the strides you're taking, that's a really exciting story, and, and thank you for sharing that with us today. Okay, I'm, I'm aware that that's all the time we have. Um, so I should say you, you should be able to, we would very much encourage you to, to leave the leave feedback with us. Um, we'd also like to remind you, you can register for, for upcoming webinars. You can see the link there. Um, and anybody whose question we didn't have a chance to answer, we will make sure those are made available to our panelists. Apologies for not getting around to all of them, but really great for those of you who, who joined in and made it an interactive session. So I'd really like to thank uh, Determin for partnering with us to bring you this session. And I'd particularly like to, to thank uh, Gerard for, for being a, 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 an excellent expert on our panel, for Richard for, for providing a really valuable procurement leader uh, perspective. And of course, thank you very much to Amy for sharing her story and the great work that uh, those guys have been doing. And of course, thank you to the audience for joining us today, for making this a great webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, please do join us again next time. Thank you.